Oh, I've never been asked that. Um, well, I think, uh, that's a good question. That's a, That actually kind of stumped me. Natalia! Natalia making her way to the ring. Natalia! What's up, I'm Joe, and welcome to the Lightweights Podcast. Today's guest, WWE superstar, Natalia. I think The Rock is so much fun to have around right now. Natalia has been in the ring for almost 20 years and spills some tea on some of her favorite WWE superstars. For example, Chad Gable. I see something so special in him. He reminds me of like Kurt Angle and Bret Hart like in one. She's daughter of Jim the Anvil Neidhart and is part of the Hart Dynasty. Who would you want to play your dad? Oh, there's... So, there's... <laughs> <laughs> and who would you want to play you? I love Sydney Sweeney, so I'm like... Sydney Sweeney should play Natty. Uh, <laughs> I was lucky enough to chat with her inside her hotel room as she was traveling for WWE Raw. So if you like this conversation, please give this video a like, leave a comment down below who else you want me to have on, and hit the subscribe button because I have Maxine Dupree and Chelsea Green coming up next. The most pay-per-view appearances, the most matches, the most wins, the most Raw matches, the most SmackDown matches, the most WrestleMania matches. When you heard all this, were you surprised? I actually didn't know I had all of these like accolades until... One day, Guinness World Records, they, they tagged me in a tweet. And I was like, wait, what? It was, it was for the most wins. And I think, like, it just was shocking to me because I didn't realize that I had that many wins. But then I, when I started to dig deeper into it, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's because I've had so many matches. And it just kind of took on a life of its own. So, yeah, six Guinness World Records in. <laughs> and you have the longest female career as well. I do. I am the longest tenured female in WWE history, which is like, it's really cool because back in the day, women weren't really in WWE for longer than a couple years. I mean, even even the guys, it's very unheard of to have a career that spans longer than maybe five years. It's showbiz and not, it's, it's very competitive in WWE and it's not, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard to survive in, in showbiz, nonetheless, WWE for that long, but here I am. <laughs> What's your secret to longevity? Because no injuries, you're still able to do it. You're killing it performing. It's crazy. Uh, thank you. It's really unheard of. I am so lucky. I've had like one ankle injury in the last 17 years in WWE. Granted, I have a little bit, you know, get bruised up. I broke my nose um, a couple years ago and... Um, I've had like little aches and pains here and there. It's wrestling. You kind of, you know, you go through stuff, but I've, I've been very, very blessed. Knock on a couch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My favorite phrase. <laughs> I've been, I've been very, very blessed with, with just, I guess, luck. And also I truly believe that, you know, especially being a professional athlete, you have to really take meticulous care of yourself because you only have this one body to do all of this and even if I wasn't a professional athlete I would still try to take meticulous care of myself because I need my body for the rest of my life so I, I do really focus on my health um what's your recovery days look like I do so much for my recovery um and it's something I've gotten really good at and and you have to be selfish and because especially working in WWE and you know doing this for as long as I have I have to make sure that I do things that I can like that can help my body recover. So I, I'm on a table three to four times a week. I work with an adrenal specialist that works on my adrenal glands. As a professional athlete and a performer, you need adrenaline. Um, so I work with a guy, TJ and I have been working with him for close to a decade. He's worked on Edge. He's worked on Undertaker. Um, he's phenomenal. And he, what exactly is that? So an adrenal specialist, what, what Jason does, um, it's, it's, it's very like niche area, but he works on massaging our adrenal glands so that you're, if you can't produce adrenaline, like a lot of athletes need adrenaline for performance. You know, Simone Biles talked about it. Like when she was in the, you know, when she pulled out of the Olympics, she was struggling with her performances because for one, there's not the crowds, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm sure she had other th reasons why she was struggling with, with her performances, but I know when you don't have a crowd to perform in front of, you don't get that same kind of adrenaline. Adrenaline is very important. It helps you with fight or flight. If, if you're not like for me, if I'm not nervous and I'm not feeling that rush before I go out, it, it, Adrenaline can keep you very safe. It gives you that extra edge. It gives you that energy that you need to perform at the very highest level, especially when you're performing around, you know, or in front of millions of people around the world. Um, so Jason works on keeping our adrenal glands really healthy so that you function at your highest level. And then he also works on our brainstem. So it's just like basically a massage. It's a two hour massage 
on your adrenal glands and, and your brainstem. Three times a week. Um, twice a week. Twice a week. So, and then I work with an active release therapist, an ART therapist that does stretching. Um, he works like to basically just professionally stretches out. Um, and then I just go for deep muscle massages on the days that I don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also like, I'm just religious about my vitamins. I love taking vitamins. I take so many different vitamins. Um, it's funny because I, I do, I do lab work about every six months just to make sure like I'm not deficient in B12. I'm not deficient in iron. I'm not deficient in, you know, like calcium or vitamin D and, and WWE actually does that, does a lot of that lab work with us. But then I do it on my own because if you are deficient for, if you're somebody that's deficient in something like B12, you'll, you'll have very, very low energy. And sometimes you might not even know it. So you'd be like, gosh, I'm feeling so tired or I'm feeling run down. It's because you're deficient in something usually. So I just, I really stay on top of my fitness and my, my health and wellness. And yeah, I love massages. I love taking care of myself. I, I love staying in tune with my body. You know, if you're even just being on a plane, I just got in yesterday from being in Saudi Arabia. It took us 18 hours to get there. Well, you went to Tampa and now we're in LA. Yeah. So even more. So I went to, so I flew from Tampa to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Saudi Arabia. I was in Saudi Arabia for under 24 hours, flew back to Frankfurt, back to Tampa, and then flew from Tampa to Los Angeles. And this is in the span of three days. So sitting on a plane for that long, you know, your hips will get really tight and you'll like feel kind of crunched up. I work with somebody, you know, the active release therapist, Matt, he's out of um, Orlando. He works on all the NXT people, but he's amazing. And he kind of unlocks everything because if you're not, if you're locked up just from sitting on a plane that long, you know, you can't perform the way that you need to. So I think part of the longevity that I have in my career is from, you know, taking such good care of myself. And you hear about this kind of stuff from LeBron James and, you know, Kobe Bryant, when he was alive, he would talk about. Um, just, you know, the, the work that he would do to stay in the shape that he was in. You can't perform and be at an elite level by just imagining it. You have to put the work in, but you also, after putting in the work, you have to put the recovery in too, you know, so that your body is performing at maximum efficiency. For someone who doesn't understand wrestling, what do you think makes a good wrestler? You mean good WWE superstar? WWE superstar. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go right to it. Because there's, you know, it's funny in, in WWE, like I'm a wrestler. I love wrestling, but we're, we're so much more than just wrestlers. And I love that because I love wrestling. I've grown up in a huge wrestling family my entire life. But like, I love everything that comes along with this career. It's so special. It's so unique. And I think you know, in some ways, I think like, yes, first and foremost, I'll always be a wrestler. But I think what makes somebody have that total package of being like a having, superstar, being a star, like having that it factor. I think it's 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 a sparkle. It's an inner sparkle that just radiates, you know, where it's like you have an emotional connection with the audience. That is the biggest thing. I think when you think of the greats in this industry, they have that that it factor, that emotional connection with the audience, because it's not enough to just be a great wrestler. Um, and I trust me, this is coming from somebody that grew up in a huge wrestling family that loves the business and that loves wrestling. It's you, this day and age to really thrive in it, you have to have that emotional connection with the audience. And that can come from so many different areas that can come from a storyline that can come from your in-ring performances that can come from the way you interact with the crowd in and out of the ring. Um, that can come from, you know, a, a challenging journey that you've been through that the audience can relate to or connect with, whether you're overcoming an injury, whether, you know, you know, somebody in your family passed away and you're going through that or um, your your struggle to get, you know, whether it's a weight loss journey or there's so many different factors that can connect you with the audience. Um and I think that that's just so important to have that sparkle, that it factor, because you can be phenomenal in the ring, but sometimes that's just not enough. And it's certainly not enough to make it in WWE. There's so many other elements that you have to have. And I look at somebody like, for example, Chad Gable. Chad, like I see something so special in him. I think he's like, a, like he's he reminds me of like Kurt Angle and Bret Hart like in one. And he is a phenomenal athlete athlete, an incredible wrestler, an incredible in-ring performer. But like in the last couple of years, we've really seen this personality come out of him. And I watched this match that he had on Monday Night Raw with um, Gunther. And you could just feel this energy and this like 
connection with him in the audience that people were just rallying behind him because of his struggle, because of, of the fight that he had inside of him. And like his little daughter was front row and she was crying because she wanted her dad to win. And you could feel his passion. It, could, it was just radiating through him. And that's like the turning point of, I think, what made, you know, took Chad from being a really great wrestler to all of a sudden Gable is like a huge star in WWE and incredibly talented and just like an extremely gifted performer. But he's now got that it factor. Are you watching every match live as it's happening in the locker room? I try to. I try to watch unless I'm doing something or filming something like for WWE because sometimes they have us running around like crazy. Um, I try to watch the matches. I think it's just a respect thing when you watch somebody's match, especially the girls' matches. I try not to miss the women's matches because it's nice to be able to talk to the girls when they come back or have somebody talk to me after my match and go, hey, I love that. That was a great match. Like You guys killed it out there. That was so good. I loved when you did that flip off the top rope or I loved your facials in this one moment they really zoomed in on it they replayed that moonsault or it's it's nice it's it's respect it's really truly out of respect I was gonna ask that because I feel like you're the person to pull things from people and then to give that feedback back of what you really like yeah like for example Liv Morgan like she had a match a couple weeks ago and it was against Zoe Stark and um I was just like, it meant so much to me because Liv, after her match, she asked me what I thought. And she was like, what did you think? Be honest with me. Like, I want to get your feedback and I want to be better and I want to grow and I want to learn. And like, she, she's just a sponge. Like, she wants to like always improve, you know? And she, she trains with me in my ring in, in Florida. And, um, she, she always just puts in like she puts in so much extra work to be better especially coming off of an injury um and she just like she wants to grow and I love that I love that she wanted advice for me and I was like so flattered by that and then it really made me think too about like what would I do differently if I was in Liv's situation in that match or like I learned a lot for myself and my own performance by watching Liv and Zoe about what I liked what I would take my time with more, what I would add, what I would, you know, take out, what I, like, because they had such a good match. But, again, when you watch other people's matches, you can find so much inspiration in them. Do you think that the way that you look at matches is rare? Nah, I mean, maybe maybe because I've been in it for so long and I've been around it my whole life and I've been surrounded, like, maybe, maybe it is because... I've got this different perspective having grown up in the industry with, you know, being part of this massive wrestling family. But my husband is also, you know, very engulfed in it. He was a wrestler for 20 years. And then now he, you know, after suffering a career ending injury, he is um, a producer in WWE. So he has a whole different perspective now um, in the last seven, eight years about how he looks at matches. So I, I do look at it very differently than I used to per, per se before even like TJ when before TJ was a producer, I'd look at it a little differently just hearing his perspective. But now that he's behind the scenes working with the girls, I have a totally different perspective. Were you always like that, even in the indies? Were you studying everything? I Yes, I loved, and I love Japanese wrestling. I, I've always loved Japanese wrestling because my coach, in, when I was, before I was in WWE, my coach, um, his name was Tokyo Joe, and he would train elite wrestlers in Japan um, for a promotion called New Japan, very, very big promotion in Japan. And um, he was always bringing in wrestlers to Calgary, where I was born. Um, Joe would bring in these famous Japanese wrestlers, and they would come and train at my uncle's gym. And we would meet them, and we would see them training. And I was just always fascinated by, like, the work ethic that they had. And, like, their. to me, I, I love Japanese wrestling. And it's so cool right now to see that kind of, like surge of of women's Japanese wrestlers, we call them um, Joshi. It's like jo Joshi is the 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 term for Japanese female wrestlers in in Japan that come from Japan. But um, <laughs> I made that really wordy. Uh, <laughs> but they're so incredibly talented. These these girls, um, like Oscar, has been training for decades, you know, to to do this, and so you, they just have so much passion. I have so much respect for them. Going back to your indie run, did you feel like every match was one step closer to where you had to be? Or did like did you feel like you were really chipping away at something? Yes. I felt like oh, it's I was struggling to get bookings. I was struggling to get people to book me on their shows because when I was wrestling when I started wrestling, like my when I started 
to take bookings and I started to like get out of the, okay, I'm not just training anymore for this. I'm actually going to try to like do active work. There weren't a lot of women in the industry. It wasn't that popular back in 2001, 2002. There wasn't a whole lot of like wrestling just wasn't what it is now. And so I would, it would be really hard to get people to, you know, independent wrestling promotions don't have the kind of money to fly you out of Canada and fly you to their promotion in the United States and then like have to get you a work permit and have to get you a flight and have to travel, you know, fl fly you internationally. And like, I didn't have a name, you know, so it's like, well, and then pay you on top of that. So it was very hard for me to get independent work, but I did end up getting a show. My very first independent show was called, um, it was at a show called Baseball Brawl in Buffalo, New York, and that's where I met Our Truth for the very first time. And he was so nice to me. He was just such, like, I always remember how great he was to me. And he just like, he was just like, I felt like he from from that moment on like took me under his wing and was like, I got your back. Like anything you need. And like, it's funny because meeting Truth all those years ago, um, I can't remember when it was. It might have been like two thousand four. I early 2000s he's still exactly the same nice sweet awesome genuine person that he is today and um but yeah I had a hard time getting booked I just had a hard time so my uncle had a promotion called Stampede Wrestling and so they um would use me all the time on their shows and then I went to England and worked for a gentleman named Brian Dixon who just recently passed away um but Brian you know, let me work over there. And although it wasn't a lot of money, it was work. It was the work experience that I needed. And then I feel like my big break was when my coach, Tokyo Joe, got me um, a tour of Japan for with this women's promotion. The name of it um, back then, it was when All Japan Women's had just shut down. And the name of the promotion was Next Entertainment Organization, NEO. So I went and worked with them. and With Japanese wrestlers? Yes, with Japanese women's wrestlers. And, and I, I assume you didn't speak Japanese. No. And I lived there for many months. And I lived in a little town outside of Shibuya, which is in Tokyo. It's a huge city in Tokyo. Um, but I lived in a little town um, called Motosumiyoshi. And I was so lonely because I was by, I lived by myself and I would travel in every day to train with the girls. And once I started training with the girls and connecting with them, it didn't matter that we didn't speak the same language because wrestling spoke that universal language. So when we would get in the ring and we would get together and we would we would train and we would perform together, it was so much fun. I, I will always, always love and respect the Japanese women wrestlers so much. They taught me so much about staying strong and being fierce and fighting for your dreams, truly. And I wasn't making anything when I went over to Japan. I don't think I was making $100 a night. So it was, it was hard. And we set up all of our own rings and it was like, you know, the, the girl wrestlers were setting up the rings. Were so, you communicating with your dad and your family and like yeah. updating them and like, am I on the right path? Like my dad was, uh, my dad became like my biggest cheerleader. At first he was like, you know, this is dangerous and I don't want you to get hurt. And I'm like, you know, you have to be careful. And like, my dad was just super overprotective, but then like he started to see that I liked it so much and that I was doing well with it. And then he started to watch me work and he became like a huge supporter of my work. And um, my family was, my uncle um, Brett and my uncle Ross and my uncle Bruce, they were very involved in wrestling and still, I feel like they still have their hand in it quite a bit. But they were also very supportive of me pursuing my dreams, especially as the first female in my family, the first female in the Hart family to pursue a career in the ring, you know, to actually be an active like wrestler um it's it was a it wasn't something any other woman in my family did like my aunt diana managed my uncle davy boy and she was part of their match at wembley stadium when she raised their hands in the ring at the end but um you know when she was young like there wasn't women there wasn't women wrestling you know there wasn't women in the dungeon that were training for this so let me, that, that, grammatically, that wasn't right. There weren't women wrestling. Sorry, my mom would be like, listen, your grammar is awful. But she, when she was a young girl, they didn't have that in the dungeon. My grandfather was just, he only trained men. So for me, I was blazing this whole new trail for women in the Hart family to do this. The first female in the Hart family to, to perform. Were you in the dungeon watching? I would watch in the dungeon and I actually trained in the dungeon. So I, that was where I got my first start in, in wrestling. I was training in the dungeon at one point there was a bear there oh yeah a bear that lived there named ted 
um, <laughs> that lived there. That lived in the dungeon. Yeah, Brett actually talks about it. It, it. So I don't think it was a huge bear. I think it was a smaller bear. But um, I don't know the whole backstory of why the bear lived at the house. But the bear was treated like a like a pet. That my grandfather treated the, this bear was so spoiled. This bear was eating ice cream. This bear was like, yeah. Brett talks about it in his book. His name was Ted. <laughs> So, and he lived in the dungeon and he would lick like ice cream off of my mom's feet and stuff like that. Like, it's crazy. You might think I'm crazy telling a story, but it's like a, it's a hard house tale that, that this bear lived in the dungeon. My grandfather had like 25 cats at one time living at the hard house, 10 dogs, dozens of cats. Like there was animal, there was chickens, like there was goats. There was, they had, um, my grandfather had like when the hard house when he first moved into the hard house, there was tons and tons of land. So they had their own cows that they would milk. And my grandfather, yeah, the hard house was a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> what were your nerves like during your first matches? And what are they like now? I get nervous before every match, every match, every single match. I'm getting nervous right now thinking about the match that I have tonight. Is it the crowd? Is it your performance? It's my performance. It's the audience. It's the people backstage. It's making my family proud. It's making myself proud. It's not letting the girls down. It's not letting my husband down. It's just trying to, like, there's so much pressure, and I love it. There's so much pressure, but I, I know it's kind of cheesy, but, like, that's where diamonds are made is when you're under pressure. And I love I love that feeling of, like, we've got to do great. We've got to nail this. We've got to like everything that we're practicing for and training for is for this moment. I love it. I thrive on it. But yes, I get, I get very, very nervous before I go out. And then the second I walk through the curtain, I'm like, <sighs> it's a crazy rush. If you could bottle up the feeling that we have in performances, if you could bottle up that feeling and make it into a drug, Everybody would be addicted to it because it's just the most insane feeling of like, there's nothing like it. And I've heard The Rock say that. I've watched The Rock come through the curtain in what we call gorilla. That's where you walk back like in and out like to get to the ring. But I've seen him come back through the curtain and go, nothing like it. Nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing like this. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's, a, it's a rush to say the least. Is there anybody, like when you're obviously traveling to all these different arenas, you don't really know who's going to be there. Who do you get most excited for when you see walking through? When I see walking through like a star? Yeah, like someone who's not on the roster right now that you wouldn't regularly see. Maybe they're doing a guest spot or something. Or they're just the, coming to watch the show. I think The Rock is so much fun to have around right now. He is, he's truly, I know on TV he plays the role of a bad guy, but in real life he's a really great person. Um, like he... He's so supportive. I remember when myself and my tag team partner at the time, her name is Tamina Snuka. Um, she's also part of the Samoan dynasty. Um, so I'm, you know, I was part of the Hart dynasty. She's part of the Samoan dynasty. So we were a tag team. We did this match at WrestleMania and we were teaming up that night. And, um, it, you know, it was during the pandemic when we were just allowed to start having fans come back. So they, they let us have an audience for the first time in like a year and a half. So The Rock sent us a message and he, he filmed this beautiful video message for us and like a selfie style video. And it was so beautiful. And he sent it to me and to Tamina. And he was like, I'm so proud of you girls. You know, think about what you guys are representing. You're representing our family and decades and generations and years and years and years of history have gone into to you two performing tonight. And when you walk out through that curtain, don't ever forget like where you came from and all the people that fought for you guys to get here. And now you're like carrying on that torch for your families. And it was just this powerful message. And literally like I thought about his words when I was walking down to the ring at WrestleMania and he just took the time, like somebody who's the biggest movie star in the world took the time for us. And, um, as a woman in the company, like when somebody takes that time for you to like really show that they care, it means the world, nonetheless, the rock, you know, so that always stuck with me. So when the rock is around, whether you like him, whether you hate him, whether he's a good guy or a bad guy, he raises every stake. He, the, the building will be sold out and, you know, granted WWE's business is booming at, at the moment and it's wonderful, but like when he's there, everybody just is on their game 
and he 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 makes it fun and and I really like he's just awesome he's an awesome person to work with and be around and like I'm really happy that he's doing stuff right now in WWE he's a true role model carrying on your family legacy when you started doing Total Divas and you brought your dad into that what did that feel like that you were bringing him into something you were doing well truthfully I was so grateful for Total Divas because and I still am to this day because when my dad's career in WWE ended and he was no longer able to be a wrestler or a football player or a shot putter because when my dad was growing up, when my dad was 18 years old, he was one of the best shot putters in the United States. He had a full scholarship to UCLA. Tons of universities were trying to get him because he was such an incredible shot putter. Naturally gifted, amazing. When he stop shot putting he ended up playing in the NFL he was um in the Dallas Cowboys and the Oakland Raiders when his football career ended he was lost and didn't quite know what to do he ended up meeting my grandfather Stu Hart in, in Calgary Alberta Canada and put his football career behind him and met my mom and started wrestling and the rest and, and met the Hart family and the rest is history um but when, when his career in WWE ended he didn't really know who he was after that like he he just didn't know where he fit into the world. And I think that happens with, and it's important to talk about, I think that happens with a lot of professional athletes where they don't, once their professional career is over, they don't know what to do. They don't have an identity. They didn't plan for, back in the day, they weren't planning for life after their careers were done. You know, a lot of them didn't, they weren't given those tools. They didn't have people coaching them or talking to them about mental health and what's the next step and where do we go and how do you start a business and my dad when he was in WWE was just focused on being a wrestler um so Total Divas gave him an outlet to be some be something else and to show the world his personality and to like it, it made him feel like he was a part of something and I will always be so so grateful for Total Divas for allowing my dad to feel like he he mattered he was able to be a part of our show. He was able to entertain people. He was able to teach people. He was able to like remind people that it's okay to be human. We covered um, on the show, we covered, I put my dad into rehab um, because he was struggling with addiction. We covered that on the show. Um, we were filming season eight of the show and my dad died um, while we were filming the show. And I remember WWE, which was very thoughtful of them, and I appreciated it very much, but they said, you know, we don't have to keep filming. You don't have to keep doing this. If you want, we can just give you a break. We know your dad just died, and it was very nice. But I said, listen, I signed up to do this show, and I think it's so important that people see what we're going through. And somebody watching at home might be able to relate. It might be able to go, my dad was going through this, or we just lost a family member, or we're going through something really hard. That, to me, is what makes that show or that to me is what makes reality TV or, you know, it, make, it makes Total Divas, it made Total Divas great, was being able to be relatable and sharing the good, the bad, and everything in between. So my dad got a lot out of that show, but I think people actually inadvertently got a lot out of watching my dad because they could see that he wasn't just, you know, he wasn't just a wrestler, he was a person that was real and he was relatable just like everybody else. If it ever came back, would you want to be part of it? Of course, of course. I'm always, always, always fighting for... For, for more for the women in WWE and I think it's important when you're in WWE you have to you have to advocate for certain things that you want to do and of course I would love to see something like Total Divas come back I think it was a great um, you know and it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly like it was before because sometimes that's hard to duplicate what we had you know like you don't have the same cast and the dynamics are different and but like it's it would be really cool to reinvent and do something very modern um, and new and kind of fresh, but like kind of still that vibe of Total Divas. Um, I would love to have it. I would love to do that. And I, I would love to I would love to do another like a revamp of Total Divas. I think it'd be so much fun. But what it was great for doing as well, it was that it was like I would meet so many women that would come up to me and go, I never ever watched WWE, but I watched it because of Total Divas. I watched Bravo or I watched, you know, The Real Housewives or I watched The Kardashians or, you know, we watched Total Divas after The Kardashians and we were like, whoa, we never, you know, we never, we never thought we would watch WWE until we watched you girls on Total Divas. Then they're bringing their kids and their husbands to the shows. And they're coming to WrestleMania and they never were wrestling fans before. So it kind of, what's great about it is, is that it gets people that never watched, especially women that never watched the show, 
watching WWE. And then women make a lot of decisions in the house. So then they bring their kids and they bring their husbands. And then all of a sudden they're all wrestling fans and they're all going, can you smell what the rock is cooking? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite moment from that show? I have so many favorite moments. Um, I love, I love, love doing that show. Um, oh. They, we would do some really fun cast vacations, and I remember so many great... Oh, my wedding. I think my wedding would be my favorite moment. Like, yeah, the cast vacations were fun. I threw somebody's luggage... I threw Lana's luggage into the ocean at one point. I remember that. <laughs> I may have had some tequila that night. <laughs> but um, but my wedding was on season one. It was the finale, and it was so much fun. And I loved, like, seeing my dad, like looking back on the footage and seeing my dad walk me down the aisle and it was just such a great time. It was so special. My cat also walked me down the aisle with my dad and there was a ton of mayhem on the day of my wedding. Of course, there was a hurricane that hit, um, a cra it was a crazy storm. Um, my cat ended up getting sick. Um, my sisters were fighting with each other. One of them may have Peter Pan's laughing. I don't want to get into that, but I won't name who. Um, what kind of storm did you have? It was a hurricane. It was like I a, had a hurricane on my wedding. Yeah, it was it was crazy. It was like because we wanted a beach wedding outside, and I didn't so realize did I. <laughs> it was so hot that my dad wanted to walk me down the aisle with no shoes on, and I was like, "Daddy, you can't like it's this is you can't do that." And uh, <laughs> my dad was like using my hairbrush to brush his beard, and it was it was so. I look back at it, it was just such a funny, funny. It was so fun. It was, but it was chaotic. Yeah, uh, that would be my favorite moment on Total Divas. What do you think you added to? the heart legacy i think what do i add to it yeah oh I, i've never been asked that um well i think uh, that's a good question that's just, that actually kind of stumped me i'm really humble I, I take pride in being humble i don't like to like go on about you know what what makes me great or what makes me great for the family but i think I'm so proud to be able to continue to carry on like the torch that my grandfather passed on to my uncles and that my uncles passed on to me. Um, that makes me so proud because I feel like I've, <laughs> I feel like I've done my family's name. Like I've, I've done the name proud and it's not easy to be a woman in this industry. It's certainly not easy when you're following in these massive footsteps, when your uncle is Bret Hart or Owen Hart or, the British Bulldog or Dynamite Kid, your dad is Jim the Anvil Neidhart. I just named like four Hall of Famers there. Um, and your grandfather is Stu Hart. Like to follow in those footsteps and to have to like blaze your own trail, I feel like I've really been able to keep my family's name alive. And I'm proud of that. I'm so proud of that. And I've been able to do it in such a positive way where people can – still think about the Hart family and see it alive and, and well today. And, and they can, when they watch me perform, they can think about my uncles and think about my grandfather and go, wow, like, you know, it's so cool to see like a heart still doing this. I'm just, I think it's, to me, it's so important to keep my family's name alive. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing for me is to continue to honor them and to continue to keep the name alive, to keep the dungeon alive, to remind people of what the dungeon was, what my grandfather started in 1955, um, to keep the Hart family name alive and to really make sure that my family is honored and represented the, in the best possible way. Is your training facility the dungeon? Well, it's, a, it's, it's called the dungeon, yes, but it's actually named after my grandfather's dungeon. So my grandfather started the original dungeon in the 50s when he bought the Hart House in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And um, it's a, it, the original dungeon was just this little room with a mat and a couple windows and these wooden walls. And my grandfather had his own weights down there. He had his own like, like he, he welded his own weights that said, the, that said his name, Hart, on the weights. And um, it's where some of the greatest professional wrestlers in the world learned how to work, learned how to wrestle, learned how to hone their craft. Wrestlers like the Dynamite Kid and Brian Pillman, my dad, Owen, Brett, Davey, um, uh, Gorilla Monsoon. Gorilla Monsoon trained with my grandfather in the dungeon. Um, my grandfather actually broke in the Von Erichs. He, my grandfather, Stu, is the reason why the Von Erichs got into professional wrestling because my grandfather met Fritz Von Erich in Edmonton and 
Fritz was was meeting with the Edmonton Eskimos, a football team, because Fr- Fritz was a football player. So Fritz von Erich met Stu Hart, and Stu said, you're big, you're a big guy, you should get into wrestling. Next thing you know, Fritz von Erich and his wife and his family were moving in, into the Hart House on, on the property. They lived in a little trailer on the property. And my grandfather broke Fritz in to wrestling. And so I thought that was so cool because we've just seen the success of the Iron Claw. Did you see it? I did. And I loved it. I thought it was so well done. And um, it was very inspiring to me. That movie inspired me so much. And I just, I couldn't believe like, because I saw the movie and I texted Brett and I said, you have to see this movie. It's so good. It's so touching. It's really powerful. And Brett told me the story about Fritz getting into wrestling through my grandfather. So I thought that was just so cool because so many people are connected to my family in such a special way. Has there ever been talks about a Hart family movie? There's been talks about a movie. Um, I can't, like I've been, it's, it's funny, I'm not sworn to secrecy, but I, I'm not allowed to say entirely what it is. It's when we say Hart family, it, 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 that's very vague. It's a very, the Hart family could be a bunch of things because listen, the Hart family, there's a ton of meat on the bone. You could, you could do a movie just on my grandfather, Stu Hart alone, because my grandfather, how he even got involved in wrestling was because he was a homeless child living in Saskatchewan, which is a place, if you know, Canada, Saskatchewan is one of the coldest places in Canada. And my grandfather lived in a tent and slept in between dogs to stay warm and his the only, and there's been many books and things written about this, but it's my grandfather's legacy. Um, the reason why he started wrestling was because he just needed a place to stay warm. So he joined the YMCA as a place to like get refuge, a place to go inside, a place to like, you know, just stay, literally find shelter. And he took up amateur wrestling, literally as a place to stay warm out of the snow and became amateur wrestling champion of Canada. So wrestling saved my grandfather's life, literally. Who would you want to play your dad? Oh, there's, there's. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you want to play you? <laughs> I well, it's funny because like I love Sydney Sweeney, so I'm like Sydney Sweeney should play Natty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Sydney Sweeney should play me, um, and I know that, but she's like I think she's so talented and like she's so pretty. So like I'm gonna go with somebody that's really pretty. <laughs> Um, I've said this in interviews before, but I think it's worth saying again. I love Paul Walter Hauser and I think he's so talented, but I love that he loves wrestling, you know, and I, and it's funny cause I, he is a huge wrestling fan and I, and he's, he loves the industry. He's passionate about it. He's wrestled in his acceptance speech at the Emmys. He, um, he like called out Matt Cardona in his acceptance speech and was like, cause he's getting ready to have a match with him or I think he had a match with him. He's about to, um, but Paul, Paul Walter Hauser loves wrestling. He has so much respect for wrestling, but the more I look at old footage of my dad, the more that I'm like, Oh my God, Paul would be like a great Jim Neidhart. Like he has like, it's, I've said this before, but I can't unsee Paul as my dad. I think he would play such a great Jim Neidhart. And I love that he loves wrestling and um, he's passionate about the industry. And like when I, when I start fantasy casting, I would, I would cast Paul. Um, but then like there's so many different people that I would think like who would play my grandfather? You know, like my grandfather, he's such a stoic, handsome man. Um, and then I think about my grandmother, Helen Hart, who would play her and like, cause she was such a beautiful woman. So there's so much meat on the bone. I think when you think Hart family, people go directly to like just Brett Owen, you know, my dad, Davey, it's, it's, it's more, it's, there's so much to my family. And I think that's what makes our family special. That's why like something like a movie on our family, um, there's just so many possibilities. When's your book coming out? My book. Uh, <laughs> Are you working on it? <laughs> um, I have been approached to write a book, and it's something I'm really interested in doing. Um, 2024 is going to be a year of huge growth for me, and I'm really excited about it. Um, there's a lot of change happening for me and a lot of positive like positive growth. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about what I'm going to be doing this year and the projects that I'm working on. It's... To me, it's the year that I've been waiting for. And people say to me, like, oh, what, what more do you want to do in WWE? Or are you happy where you're at? Or what, what, like, what are your feelings? Or, you know, do you still want to do, do this or that? And it's like, I still want so much more. I want so much more. I, I've been fighting for so much more for so long. And I think that's what's kept me in WWE for 17 years is that I've never stopped being hungry. I've never stopped going to work like it's the, my first day on the job. 
I've never stopped fighting for my dreams, fighting for opportunities, fighting, fighting to be the best, fighting to honor my family in the way that they should be honored. Like I just, I have so many more dreams and so many more goals that I want to accomplish. And this year is like a big start for that for me. Is it easier now with Triple H being there since you've worked with him and you've kind of seen him in the locker room that you can approach him with ideas? Well, the thing with Triple H is that he's he's younger. So it's not to say that like, and again, I'm not age shaming anyone. I, I, I think that with Triple H, he used to be a wrestler. So he was in your shoes. Yeah. So he knows what it's like to be a talent and he knows what it's like to do this. He knows what it's like to go out there and to excel or to make mistakes or to grow or to get I mean he's been he tore his quad once in the ring and finished the match he I mean so he know he knows what it's like to be in the ring with us like doing what it is that we do he knows he knows about all the frustrations that we might have and um but he's younger so like if I go to him with an idea he he's able to like process it a little differently and um take it into consideration and we it's it's definitely it's it's been it's been a like with the in the last six months with WWE we've seen we've seen so much change and and I feel like when you go to our shows you're really like you're getting you're getting such a great product like people are really loving the storylines coming to life and there's a lot of continuity and you're seeing a lot of a lot like to me what I what I would love to see in 2024 is women's wrestling is soaring w women's wrestling storylines taking over on raw on smackdown on NXT you know we have so many talented female wrestlers in the company right now and I think like to to give the girls a really strong focus this year. I think we we have more than earned it and we we deserve it and I'm hoping to see that. Like I think I, I feel like Triple H will really help us with getting more of a focus for the women. So I hope I hope and pray for that all the time because yeah. the girls are fighting so hard to just feel like they matter. And um I think I think that we moving over to Netflix and you know there's a lot of change and growth right now in the company. I know NXT has a new TV deal. SmackDown has a new TV deal. Raw has a new TV deal. It's going to allow for a lot of um, progress and change and growth and, and storylines for the girls and just room for everyone to shine. Moving to Netflix, is that live? I actually don't know the particulars of what that deal is. I I know that Netflix, it's like kind of a first of its kind for Netflix to do a li huge. live live sporting show on their like, you know, because Netflix is all filmed stuff. But with WWE, what makes it exciting is that it's like we were we have Guinness World Records for Raw and SmackDown being the longest running episodic TV shows in television history. Raw being number one and SmackDown being number two. So it is huge. Um, that we would be going to Netflix, but it's like WWE, it's, we thought, you know, just when you think you can't grow any bigger, we keep growing and we keep evolving and we keep changing and we keep changing the game during the pandemic in 2020, when every other place and every other sp huge sporting outlet shut down, WWE did not miss one show. We never stopped. I did a WrestleMania match with Liv Morgan in front of four people. And normally WrestleMania is in front of masses, you know, it's front, in front of a stadium full of people. I did a match with Liv Morgan for WrestleMania during the pandemic with a referee, a producer, and a cameraman, and a sound producer. And a, like we had four, we literally had four people in the room doing the match and we made it work because that's what we do in WWE. We roll with the punches literally and figuratively. We just roll with the punches. And I think the examples that we set as far as like, even just with the way we were so ahead of, ahead of the curve digitally, when the whole world had to go digital because everything shut down, WWE was already digital. We were already doing so much digitally that it was such a smooth transition for us. We've always been kind of ahead of the curve and we were able to just jump right in. It's like, okay, there's a pandemic. We can't have fans, but we're not going to stop giving people entertainment. We're not going to stop giving people a reason to tune in on a Monday night when they're st when the whole world is stressed out. We're going to give them some relief, and we did. And I'm so proud that we worked through all of that because it was not easy. Listen, not, performing in front of a performing in front of a crowd is so much fun. Try performing in front of no crowd. It's not the same, but we still did it. We still pulled it off and we, we like showed that anything is possible. It's ever evolving. 
always adapting. And I think that's why you're so successful and you've been doing it for so long is because you are able to do that on a whim. Um, yeah. I know you have to get to an arena soon. Yes. I have a big match tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for making the time, for making this happen in the hotel room. Yeah. We got to, we got to mingle in a Marriott. Yes. Um, but no, it's great. I, I always feel like whatever it takes, whatever it takes to like make these connections. I love your show. Oh, um, and it's, it's funny because, you know, you get to like almost live vicariously through people through social media and so you do such a great job with your show so when you asked me if I would be on your show I thought it was a huge honor oh I was honored you responded <laughs> and I was like this will be great it'd be so much fun to like and I love supporting people that built their own businesses and you know have a dream and a passion for what they do and I, I feel like you do and you started from the ground up so I think that's so awesome and I have so much respect for that so yes thank you so much for having me on it was such an honor and I hope everybody enjoys watching this as much as I enjoyed filming it thank you Natty uh, all of Natty's links are gonna be linked down below so go check her out and yeah we'll, I'll see you at the arena tonight yeah that's awesome lightweights out thank you so much you're so welcome that, that was, was great. great that was a great interview